The discovery of psychedelics is the discovery that all of this cultural machinery is just Wizard of Oz stuff. Go think. Feel. It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. That's it. How did it feel to you? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The prophecy. Welcome to the Astral Mind Podcast. What's up, guys? It's Cal Marquez. Thank you so much for joining me again on another episode of the Astral Mind Podcast. My Astral Mind Mystics, here's peace, here's love, here's life. I hope you're having your best day. If you're not, choose to do so because your reality exists in your mind and you can control how you experience the day. I want you guys to go forward with that. You know, I always talk about that. You can change the day. You can give it your all and make it a great day. If you have the power to, why not? Today, I have a very special guest on. A very, very special guest. Every guest is special. Every guest is amazing. But today, we have Justin Caffrey. I'm so glad to have him on. Uh, He's a proven multi-business entrepreneur in different sectors and countries who's built a solid regulated company with seven figures, multiple companies. He's a certified investment fund, hedge fund director, and private equity professional. You know, after going through some traumatic events, he's found himself, he's found resilience and the the real treasure of meditation, the real treasure of finding yourself and uh, reaching this place of homeostasis, reaching this place where you're no longer fearing the future and regretting the past, but you're in the flow state. And he's going to tell us all about that today, so I'm happy to have you. Justin, please tell us a little bit about you. Say hello to the audience, introduce yourself a little bit, and we'll go from there, buddy. Hey, Cal. Thanks for having me on, and, and hi to your audience. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying uh, listening to your podcast and listening to your back episodes over the last few days. And uh, yeah, it's nice. I'm, I'm here in in Wicklow in Greystones in in Ireland and it's uh yeah it's it's a bit overcast but it's Saturday it's a holiday period so life is good so first things first Justin I want to know specifically uh where you got your start in all this how did you start in business how did you start uh to be a 21 year old uh leader in a banking business and and how did all of this stuff get started for you what was the pivotal moment where you knew that meditation led to this and that you know finding yourself kind of oriented your life in the right way sure absolutely um so yeah i mean i my i suppose my career started out um quite young i went to work in the in the city of london which is like wall street so it's the it's the uk equivalent of of wall street um i worked in in banking from a very young age um, and, you know, by the time I was 21, I was leading um, a team of, of 10, 11 people. Um, at that stage, I was probably making $150,000 equivalent, which was 21 was a few years ago. So like that was back in the 90s. Um, by the time I was 23, I f- really felt like I had outgrown the bank. My ego was massive um, and I wanted to to build my own um, financial services boutique. So I jumped ship, um, left a very well-paid job um, to to go and set up my own business. And that was my first real step into a more entrepreneurial um, state of um, work and career um, from that point on. And then over the next uh, 10 to 15 years, I built a number of companies in financial services in different countries. Um, I sold those businesses, regulated in investment markets, complex um, businesses, complex markets with with phenomenal teams of people and had a lot of success, made a lot of money. Um, But I would say in terms of, you know, spirituality and, and, and a sense of self, I was a workaholic. I was very much disconnected from family, from me, 
um, from any other meaning other than, you know, the next deal um, and, and keep pushing forward. Um, and that was the kind of driving, motivating factor for me for many years. And that's great because when you're in that mindset, you can you can keep pushing forward, you can hustle hard and you can grow and build and, and, and that brought a lot of success. But at the behest of relationships, you know, for, for all of my 20s, I have no memory of that period of time except work. I don't remember vacations. I don't remember friendships. I don't really remember very much. Um, but, you know, that was the trade-off. And I think one of the things that I teach nowadays is that you always have to trade time for money. You know, if you want more money, you're going to have to trade time to get that. And that time can often be away from friends, away from family, or away from yourself, you know, a soulless existence. Um, but life was 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 pretty good. I I then met my wife into my early 30s. We had our first son when I was uh, 34. And then we were on vacation and she was pregnant on our second. And I just sold another business. Um, we were thinking about where we were going to go and live next in Europe, um, taking some time out. And she went into labor. Our second son arrived um, at uh, 26 weeks, which was pretty premature. And this was 2010. And uh, we got stuck in Spain on our vacation, a long way from home in a country that we didn't speak the language. Um, and he was in neonatal intensive care and really ill for, for six months. Um, and then we got to take care of him by the hospital, you know, within like half a mile of the hospital under medical care to see if we could get him healthy enough to travel home with us. That didn't sadly work out. So we spent another four months in and out of hospital again. And, uh, and Joshua died um, 11 months into that experience in Spain. So gone from a point of life where pretty much everything that I touched turned out the way I wanted it. And then something happened that I had absolutely no control over. And that just spiraled our whole family life and existence out of control. So as you can imagine, that's a kind of a learning point and, and a, a moment where life changes dramatically. Um, I'd like to say that that was the time when I when I really um, found a better sense of myself and, and something bigger than me. Um, but after his death, I then went to build another business. And within six weeks of, of Joshua's funeral, I was back flying all over the world, um, you know, 150, 160 flights a year, building another company, CEO of another investment fund. And, um, and then two years later, I had a panic attack in a really important meeting. Um, and it was just unresolved grief, plus all the stress and anxiety of, of you know, life that I hadn't really tapped into. I'd come from a challenged environment growing up at home. I think a lot of the times these challenged environments create the mindset and resilience and tenacity of, of, of people who can keep pushing forward no matter what, right? They've got bigger, bigger pockets to dig into to keep pushing forward. But eventually that elasticity snaps. <laughs> And that happened to me, and and uh, and that was when I when I realized, okay, holy crap, I need to get help. I need to figure out what's going on here. And that's when life really changed. Yeah, that's that's powerful. It's powerful because like you don't see too many people you, your age at that time who are doing that and who have that uh, you know that ability to manage all of that and to be making so much money. You had to be full of yourself. You had to be and for good reason, because you were, you were finding success and you were doing the work you, that you had to to reach a certain place. And so I feel like that's that's so important. That's that's really powerful stuff. I know a lot has gone on in your life and I want to reach every point of that. I, I want to talk about all of that. But I feel like talking about the things in the beginning, talking about your life and steps helps to kind of flow into everything else. And I'm extremely interested in the mindset that you had to adopt to lead a team. Uh, at such a young age, what was that process like? Yeah, I, I think especially when I was when I was that young, it was really tough because most people were like 15 years older than me. Um, so people who were working for me were a lot older. Um, I was working with a lot of people who, you know, came from a legal background and accountancy background. Um, I was a, I was a, a college dropout. I went to study computer science and dropped out and ended up in banking. Um, but I think the the strength that I had. Um, number one was emotional intelligence, the capacity to be able to monitor the room and figure people out around you and understand what makes them tick. So being able to understand 
not to manage a group, but to manage an individual. And within that process, the group dynamic works really well. And that works whether it's your employees, whether it's your stakeholders. And it's something that, you know, I teach today um, um, a lot of, in, in a lot of my corporate work is this idea of psychological safety. And it wasn't, it didn't have a phrase or a name um, back in, in the 90s, but it was something that I understood in terms of how to get the most out of people was to meet them where they were. And that doesn't mean that you're some kind of like softy. I think if you were to ask people, especially who worked for me back then, what I was like, I'd say they'd say I was pretty tough, but I was fair. Um, so you, you, you kind of set expectations pretty high and then you look to meet people at a level that you believe that they can move up to. And, you know, we had a pretty, pretty strong team. We had incredible high performance teams in, in many of my businesses. Um, and from a, from a work perspective, my mantra is always, you know, this whole idea of activity will equal results. You know, if you maintain activity, it will come. And most times and most businesses fail. And a lot of my success was in private equity and in private equity, we used to buy out of businesses where the entrepreneurs had probably gone in with great gusto. You know, they may have put all their life savings into a business and, and then it fails. And more often than not, you find, you don't find that the business has failed. What's failed is their belief to stay in the game because you can often set up a company and say, I'm going to go at this for the next 12 months and I'm going to put, you know, could be, $5,000. It's all the money I have in the world. I'm going to put it in there and I want to build my business. And when people set expectations in terms of a 12 month timeline, by the time they've got to month nine and it's not happening yet, the belief starts to wane. And once belief goes, everything else will fall by the wayside. So it's that idea of activity equals results, stay active. And we would buy businesses in private equity because we knew that if the business had been running for two years, the entrepreneurs would generally had put in so much work and effort. There was a tidal wave of goodwill and business that was likely to follow, but they give up because they lose that sense of belief. And I think it's the, the simplest thing is just to, you know, keep putting one foot in front of another. You know, it's like I tell my son all the time, who's, who's 15, remember how to eat an elephant. You know, it's like one bite at a time. Yeah. Don't look at it and think, how do I get around this? You know, you take out your knife and fork and you got to start with one bite at a time. And that's what it is in business. Make it small, stay consistent, keep active and stay in the game and realizing that the obstacle is the way. Like that's a, an old Taoist philosophy that goes back thousands of years. Like the obstacle is the way. Keep seeing the obstacle. Man, that's it. Okay, that's in my way, but I'll get past it. I'll get past it and I'll keep going. Yeah, it's so hard to maintain this level of stick with it, you know. Um, I feel like I've been in that place before where I, I haven't had enough. Like I, I've wanted to pull back. I've wanted to stop. I wanted to, you know, kind of reorder my steps. Like I didn't have the energy to keep pushing. But that it is interesting how you say that, that Taoist philosophy, just to take these situations that are challenging and follow along that path. Because if it's challenging, that's what you need to be doing to grow. But it's hard to get to that place because, you know, everyone wants the easier path. Everyone wants to make money fast. Everyone wants to change their life quickly and easily. But it just doesn't happen like that. Uh, sometimes you have to develop this strength within you, this resilience like you talk about from, from your past and your childhood. It gives you deeper pockets to reach into, to keep going when things become difficult. Um, and, you know, what is it that gives you that resilience? Where do you feel like you, you found that resilience and maintain that strength of mind? Like, how does that come about? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big student of neuroscience, and, that, and that's a lot of what I bring into my teaching. Um, and the, the idea and understanding of the dynamic of our mind is so important. You know, on average, everybody has about 60,000 thoughts a day. And of those thoughts, 90% of them are negative. And we also know that 95% of all negative thoughts never actually come to fruition. So what's important is if you can understand the voice in your head, and if you can acquaint yourself with that voice in your head, you know, that voice in your head that's telling you 
this isn't going to work out. You know, that your mom was right, your dad was right, your brother was right, your cousin was right, your friend is right. You know, you're not going to make this work. You should stop. You should back away. Because people around you will constantly tell you why they don't think you're going to make it. There's very few people that you have in your life who will be around you telling you why they think you will make it. And even the ones that do tell you that, it can often be a little bit disingenuous. And you know that they're like, not really meaning it because if you want to stand out and be different, and if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to be a professional sports person, this is 1% territory of society. And the minute you step outside, you will be looked upon differently. And unfortunately, people will want you to fail. So what you have to realize is that the, 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 the voice in your head, the negative voice in your head that we all have, it's been fed information by other people. So you have to be able to sit down and talk to it and identify what's going on. And even something as simple as, you know, if, if you believe in God, if you believe in the universe, then you have another person that you can talk to about what's happening in your head at that moment. You know, why am I fearful? Why do I think I'm not going to make it? Instead of just allowing it to be this, cyclical conversation that goes around in your head you sit down and you share that through prayer through conversation with the universe you know you can have a moment to be and open up to somebody else because often you know we might have access to coaches we might have access to therapists and, and i'm a trained therapist and i work as a coach but i know that there are things that even my clients won't want to say to me because they're deep rooted in the sense of I was told when I was six years of age that I was useless. I was never going to make it. And that's the thing that I have the most fear in my heart about. So really getting to the point of having that conversation to be able to share it, write it down on paper if you need to, communicate with it through whatever form you need, your God, your universe, however you need to do that. But don't allow it to stay perpetually looping around in your head because that will drag you down and that will put, force you down. And the last thing is just on that point, it's important to know that we have this negative bias in our head because we're preconditioned to survive. So our actual neurological makeup is such that when we wake up in the morning, we're set up to look for danger in order to survive. So recognize that too. know that, hey, the reason why all this negative stuff keeps coming at me is because my nervous system is working as it should. Now, just because it's saying all these things to me, I don't have to believe them. If some dude was following you around on your street every day, screaming at you all the time, telling you that you're going to fail, you're going to lose, you're no good, everybody thinks you're a failure, you're a fraud, da da you'd be like, man, get out of my face. Like, stay the hell away from me. Yeah, chill out, man. <laughs> yeah, chill out. Like, <laughs> that's the conversation we have to have with our own heads. Mm. Mm, I see, I see. Very good, very good. I think that'd be very helpful. And, and that makes sense. I can I can touch bases on a few of those things, like interrupting that pattern of negative yeah. thought. I didn't know it was so many negative thoughts. You said 60,000 thoughts, 90% uh, of them is negative. But I, yeah. I know that the limbic system is like always looking for the danger. You know, the, the brain is always searching for this, you know, because back in that time we were looking for, you know, animals that were coming to get us, you know, things like that. Um, other people that were coming to get us when life was more dangerous in that sense. And for some people it still is. Uh, and we have to move out of that mindset. And you're suggesting that the best way to move out of that mindset is just to interrupt the pattern. So interrupt the pattern. And, and, you know, look, one of the great things when I, when I teach the neuroscience of fear to leaders, like this is critical. If you're a leader of an organization and you start to get drawn into fear, what happens is your cognition is depleted by 60%. So when you're being driven by fear, when you're feeling anxious, your capacity to actually perform at your highest level is off. You know, if you look at whether it's, you know, professional basketball player, soccer player, whatever sport you look at, when that professional athlete is having problems in their own personal life and they have to add a split second onto their decision to take that shot, they will miss. And what happens in that situation is they leave flow state. They disconnect from what we call homeostasis in neuroscience, that capacity to perform without thinking. 
But when they have to think to perform, it's that marginal difference that means, you know, they miss that all important shot because it's not out of instinct. And in the same way as a business leader, but also as a, as a parent, as a friend, when we're operating out of fear and we're feeling anxious, our, our prefrontal cortex, like this executive function, this really smart part of your brain shuts down. And a good analogy to think about it is when you're in flow state, it's like you're, you know, five rows back in the movie house in the most, you know, luxurious chair with your favorite drink and your popcorn and you're watching the movie of your life and everything is as sweet as it can be. The sound is fantastic. The screen is unbelievable. Mm. But then when you get trapped into fear, it's like you get sucked out of that movie theater and now you're outside trying to look in through a steamed up window and you can just about hear it properly and you're trying to be participating in that movie again that's what's happening to us when we get hijacked neurologically and that's why you know i teach about this as a hugely important part of behavior for professional sports people and for executives and leaders because if we can if we can get past that and interrupt those thoughts which you know cold water meditation mindfulness mm. exercise the right diet you know we, we there's a great theory called polyvagal theory which is which is 20 years old now and polyvagal theory really looks at this whole idea of how do we stay inside homeostasis how do we stay in optimal performance and there's lots of things that we can do but it's about trying to live healthy be kind to yourself stay in good shape and that way then when you show up for your business your friends your family it's like that that player in the NBA who's going to go onto court, if his life is falling apart, if the you know paparazzi have just you know disclosed some story or he's got a whole lot of stuff going on at home, it's hard to perform on the court. It's the same for all of us. Hmm. That's a good point. The you mentioned the flow state, and I it's one of those things that I love hearing because it's like this: you're in the moment, you're in the present moment. I, I wrote a book called The Cure for Enlightenment, and in that book, I talk about being in the present moment. I talk about how you know we spend a lot of our time fearing the future and regretting the past, and not yes. enough time in the present moment. And that's the flow state, exactly. You know, being able to act without thinking. That that's that's powerful. Acting without that that like judgment of oh, is this right? Is this going to work? Um, now, as we move forward in your life, you obviously lost your son. That's, that's a very difficult thing. I couldn't imagine it. it hasn't happened to me. I've lost people in my life, but, um, uh, those are tough things. Uh, and I imagine you had to, you had to overcome something to get there, you know, to get past that. I know you jumped right back into business. It seems like a workaholic's dream, you know. Uh, you know, something bad happens, and you're like, at least I've got work to fall back into, you know. It's a distraction. Yeah. Uh, how have you managed that tendency in yourself to work every hour of the day? I feel like I have the same thing. I could work from sun up to sundown and keep going. It's just like this, there's more progress to be made. I have to do it. Where does time management come in? Yeah, uh, great, great question. I think, you know, for me, um, recognizing that I was a workaholic was important. And, and it was part of um, coming to terms with with not grieving for, for my son's um, death, um, which, which led to PTSD and anxiety. Then I ended up with a whole bunch of autoimmune diseases. Um, my, my physical body started to fall apart as my mental state became, continued to deteriorate. So when I went into therapy, um, one of the big realizations was that my behavior around work was corrosive. And also I was realizing that I was, I was medicating myself through alcohol. Um, and, and I needed to do two big things. One was stop drinking and the other one was regulate how I deal with work. Um, and at that stage, I was the CEO of, of an investment fund um, at, a, at a pretty hardcore board um, who, who I'd brought together as a phenomenal team. But they were all like, you know, top class lawyers um, and, and three accountants who'd all come from like top four accountancy firms in the world. Um, and they weren't the kind of people that you would rock up to and talk about the fact that I'm feeling pretty anxious. I don't think I grieved mm -hmm. properly for the death of my son and mm -hmm. um, I have PTSD. Um, so I, I had to go off and get help um, and, and, to, and to manage that. 
now in hindsight, you know, I've realized that these are the conversations that we have to have. Uh, you know, I teach psychological safety as part of my corporate work. And that's that idea that if we do open up this capacity to talk to other people about our mental health, we can shift and change it. So it, that brought me to a point of, of recovery. Um, it actually brought me to a point of then studying with my therapist, who was, who was a psychiatrist, um, who was working in, in Western psychiatry for 25 years, but gave up because he realized that all he was doing was medicating his clients um, on higher levels of, of um, antidepressants and, and antipsychotic medication without seeing results. And he actually resorted back to practices that his grandfather had taught him in India. Um, and that's the kind of lineage then that I went to study within. Oh. So I think the, the, the long answer to your question is how I got to that point, and that is an awareness state. So by becoming aware of who I am, how I operate, and what my behaviors look like, I'm able to adapt and change. So I left the world of financial services seven years ago, and I work now in, in coaching and leadership. Um, after studying uh, in therapy and then going on to do a master's. But I'm still very much aware that I can easily get sucked back in. And, and as an example, you know, um, for my own investments, I don't manage any of my own investments. Um, I use third parties to manage my investments. Um, a lot of my friends constantly want me to, to talk to and discuss and to get involved in cryptocurrency. I know whether it's investment markets or, or crypto markets, it's like me, you know, shooting up heroin straight into my arm. Mm. Um, it's not going to be a good outcome. Um, I will get totally sucked into it. So I, I understand the financial markets very well. And, and I look at and, and watch crypto and, and, and look at what's happening in the market. And, and I advise um, a couple of funds on it. But I have to create that sense of awareness. You know, it's like if you've been in through AA, and you're an alcoholic, you generally will try and avoid going to, you know, a bar. Um, now, thankfully, I'm not an alcoholic. I, I consciously chose to stop drinking. But for me, I've got to make some tough choices around work to make sure that I don't get sucked into that rabbit hole. And that's that awareness. You know, what is it that is negative or takes you away from being the most conscious version of you? You know, the highest performing state of you is the one that's in flow state. So whatever interrupts that, needs to be avoided and understanding that's important hmm. yeah definitely pulling yourself out of that place of just falling into a pattern of negative things doing something yeah. negative being aware i do have a problem with working too much i have a problem with work-life balance and i need to sort that out uh, that self-awareness usually is the first place uh, I, I can see that you seem like the type of individual who could get into crypto and I'm going to get to the top of the world with this. Like I can do this. <laughs> and I like that. Oh about yeah. You. I love that. Yeah. Uh, that you... would, that would absolutely be the case. But it's remember what I said at the start, mm. we're always trading time for money. Yeah. So if you want to have more time, whether that's like your friends, your family, whatever else, you have to realize that you're going to earn less money. So it's once you enter that equation, you've got to swap one for the other. You can't have both. So what are you willing to give up and what's important to you? They are important things to question. Yeah, that's a, a really good way of putting it. You know, that, that hits close to home. You said that, you know, all through your 20s, you didn't have friends. You didn't have, you know, a lot of these relationships. You didn't even remember very much outside of work. Um, but a lot of people would look at your life and say, that's the goal. Like, that's that's work goals, right? There. That's life goals, you know, being a... 23 year old you know making so much money and having control over your life a lot of people look for that uh but there is balance needed and you said after all of these things that happened you started having these panic attacks your body was unhealthy that's when you connected with your therapist and he just so happened to have roots back to india back to these practices i love how the serendipity moves us <laughs> through these moments tell me a little bit about that was that buddhism that you got into was it uh, something more uh, specific more niche so um my therapist at the time um dr uh, pradeep chatter is an interesting guy he um so he's he's a sufi which is which is a a very ancient mystical religious practice um, and, and, and I only discovered that he was a Sufi actually quite a few years afterwards because his approach was not 
so much bringing the spiritual into the therapy but principally the key part of his of his approach was helping you understand the need to slow down and to pay attention to yourself to become aware that you were more than your thoughts um and um and also for you know a big part of that was also coming to terms with a lot of the traumas that i dealt with as a kid and then you know losing my own son um and and being able to recognize that we can shift these traumas out of your mind like when you when you said earlier on the idea of of the flow state is when we're getting interrupted you know we're we're getting caught between the past and the future we come into this world fearless as human beings and future fears can only exist because of past experience right we can't decide to be fearful of something in the future if we've got nothing to actually tether it to in terms of something that's happened to me in the past so when you go in and tap into your past experiences and as an example like joshua's death for me was really traumatic i watched him die in my wife's arms and the only time that used to come as a flashback, you know, like in a, like in a movie would be every time I'd be taken off and landing on, a, on an airplane when they say, you know, okay, put away your headphones, you know, turn off your screens, all that kind of stuff. And now I'd have to be left with my own thoughts. And in that moment, I would see the flashbacks of his final moments. And part of the work that I would do that, that I did with, with Pradeep and, and what I do now when I, when I'm working with people myself is, recognizing that when we have these trapped traumatic thoughts this is a survival mechanism that the brain works out really well in order to keep us moving forward so it notices this is really traumatic this is quite likely to even lead to my human being committing suicide so we take this traumatic memory and we fire it away at the back of our mind in this traumatic state and we only ever get to see like fleeting moments of it fly in front of us and then it goes back again and it works quite well for a time. And as a survival mechanism for, you know, creatures that dominate this planet for 200,000 years, it's been fantastic. But in the 21st century, it can be a bit impeding because every time you've got a traumatic issue, it gets fired into this part of your brain. And eventually it all feels like it's overwhelming and I've got no space in there anymore. So the approach that we used and and what, what we call is, is a wiper technique, which is as simple and as primitive as it sounds, right? And if anybody ever wants to try this, there's a YouTube video on my channel where you can go on and you can actually um, watch the YouTube video and I'll show it, walk you through it. But in essence, if you take as an example, Joshua's death, I would be um, in session working on that. I'd have my eyes closed and I would meet his death with my eyes closed after going through some nice breathing. So I'm in a very relaxed, semi-meditative state and I would keep meeting those final moments over and over again. And as I keep meeting them, I start to realize that they're not happening to me now because all these traumatic feelings and all these traumatic memories, they, they're, they're still felt in our body, like in your chest, yeah. your stomach, your shoulders, as if it's like happening in the moment because our nervous system is super dumb. It gets alerted to that and it wants you to go, whoa, get away from it. Yeah. But we would work on it and we would actually allow the nervous system to then start to notice, oh yeah, this did happen in the past. And the more that I'd see those moments of him dying, the more I'd open up to see past that moment and actually remember good stuff about his life. Remember all the positive stuff in the year that we had together. And all of a sudden I'm shifting this from a deeply held fear into a memory that is just like all of the other memories that operate in the past. Because if it's a traumatic memory, what happens is my future is going to be predicated on the fear of my other son dying, of my wife dying, of people around me dying. My nervous system thinks people that you love and care about will die. Or if you've lost your job, your nervous system thinks you will always keep losing your job. Or if somebody's left you or there's been you know, an unfaithful partner, you think everybody's going to be unfaithful. So you have to work through that traumatic memory and then you shift those future issues. And that's how we move into being more present to our experience. And back to what you said, Cal, which is so important. That's flow state. That's the bit where we're not getting caught, worried about the future, regretting the past. Mm. Very well stated. That's, that's very well stated. 
I feel that that touches on a lot of issues that I've had, a lot of them, especially with like fear of people betraying you, you know, fear of loss of a job. And you say these things just like they come up from the mind with flashbacks and things like that. And a lot of people think that flashbacks are, as they're depicted in movies, they like take over your field of vision and you're like there again in Vietnam. No, no. Like a flashback is it'll come up and you'll be thinking about this thing that happened in the past. And like you said, you'll feel the emotion happening to your body. You'll feel the stress again. Palms start to sweat. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm going into this again. Like that this is happening again is what slows us down. And having the approach of revisiting those negative moments and those traumatic events under a controlled setting so that the mind associates that with it's not happening right now. I feel like that is a powerful thing. I don't hear that a lot of places. It's like you've got to visit it. And when you visit it, enough times under control you get past it absolutely you know like the the thing is you need to do it in the safety of being present to yourself and you know some people you may need to be with somebody on a professional level at this point but what i would say to people who want to explore this idea is start with something small right so if there's a if there's a big traumatic thing that's gone on don't start there maybe start with you know the friend who's been like a total ass and, and, you know, maybe has, 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 you know, really had, had something terrible called you out in a bad way or whatever, that's really triggered you start with that relationship and use something that's not the most traumatic and get used to it. But the point is, and, and why this is kind of radical and, and like for, um, um, Dr. Pradeep Chatter, when he brought this to the world 15 years ago, um, he's not well thought of in psychiatric circles because doesn't require medication and most importantly we work on people's traumas to get them back into an effective state to rejoin society quickly okay so it's not you're not in therapy for two years five years or ten years this is this is not meeting up and saying to your therapist well, how how you know therapist says to you hey Kyle, you know how's this week been for you you know you want to walk me through some of your issues and you discuss the week like mm -hmm. what's the point of talking about the week why am I in the state that I am? You know, what has happened to me that's got me to this point where I'm not firing on all cylinders and how can I manage this? And this is the whole idea that your nervous system holds on to all of this information. It's like embedded in it. And we can reconnect to the nervous system and say, hey, some of this stuff that you've got here, it's not filed correctly. Like even Joshua's death, it's traumatic, but it's not enough to stop me from living my life to be the best dad that I can be best husband that I can be, the best coach that I can be, the best friend that I can be. So I need to shift that memory so that it's just part of my history so that I can continue to lead my life. So we have to realize that so much of what happens to us is a hijacking of our nervous system. And we have a capacity to step in and intervene. And it's hard, right? And, and people will say to me, oh, yeah, you know, I'd like to do this work. But I don't really want to have to deal with all of the shit that happened to me in the past. And, and I said, well, you know, it's already here, right? <laughs> you know, it's, mm. it's the thing that makes your palms sweat and makes your, makes your heart pound when you get drawn into that memory in the middle of a meeting or when you're driving your car or when you're, you know, you're, you're walking on the street, you can get sucked back into it. So if it's already here, what's it like if you go and really meet it, kind, come to terms with who you are and where you've come from, because then then you will find that you are this immense universal being that's connected to something way bigger than all of us. And the capacity that you can operate from at that level is mind changing. Mm. Definitely. You talk about how your mentor taught you that you're not your thoughts. Mm. To me, that's a very important thing. To me, that that kind of like removes you from the trauma even further. It's like, I'm, I'm not these things that have happened to this body. I'm watching this in the film house, you know, in the movie yeah. house. I'm here just observing these things happening. What are some practices you have to stop associating yourself with the thoughts, whether they be positive or negative? Yeah. I mean, the breath is like one of the best ones because... When you have those moments where, like you said, Cal, you know, your palms can start feeling sweaty, you know, you get drawn into, into, into a, a thought in your mind that, you know, oh yeah, this is the one that destabilizes me. You know, I'm not going to be able to operate at my best in this moment. Connecting to the breath is critical. 
when we move into this fight and flight stage. Okay, so most people with anxiety, with PTSD, are living in a stressed state. And most autoimmune diseases, whether it's you know, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, chronic pain, um, adult asthma, sinusitis, rhinitis, all of these things are autoimmune diseases. And what you find is that people have a predisposition to high levels of stress because the body wants you to deal with the stress. When it feels overloaded, it's going to start tapping on your shoulder, you know, and you might end up with maybe, you know, a little bit of eczema on your skin. Well, why is that there? You know, we're in this world where we go, well, I'll go down to the, you know, the drugstore and they'll put something on it and, and then I hope it will go away. Well, why did it come? You know, why have you got this? Because the body will constantly be the roadmap to ask you to lean into the challenges that you're facing mentally because it wants to heal itself. It's got this immense capacity to heal itself. But instead, we go and work on the acute issue. I'll deal with the eczema. And then the eczema becomes sinusitis or rhinitis or, you know, I end up with asthma and, you know, I've got um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Like all of these things are all just elevations upward of you not leaning into and dealing with the stress and anxiety. So simple things like the breath is incredibly powerful. So when you start to feel overwhelmed, lean into breathing. And one of the best breath techniques, which is, has been a fantastic study just out of Stanford University on the 31st of uh, March this year, um, a great um, expert in the field, David Spiegel, has brought this study out to identify one of the best and, and most impactful ways to shift your state in terms of your nervous system and anxious states and, and, and to bring yourself into a more focused way of being is for five minutes every day to simply practice a breathing technique which requires you to take a deep breath in. And as you breathe all the way in and you think you've like reached your level, then just top it up at the very top and then just breathe out really slowly. So we now are able to identify from the, the, the detailed studies that they've con conducted in Stanford University to show that in terms of the outcome for people who were part of the study over this 28 day period, that simple extra inhale at the very top and then the slow exhale was helping their nervous system regulate itself. And doing this for five minutes a day, I mean, like who hasn't got five minutes, right? But consistently showing up allows your nervous system to notice, ah, we can calm down here. We don't have to stay in this heightened state. Like most people are actually living in the stress state all the time. We're not supposed to be there. We're supposed to be like 95% of our time, we're in the non-stress state, homeostasis, the parasympathetic, rest and digest. Hmm. But we're in the fight and flight. So in fight and flight, what happens? Your digestion doesn't work properly. So people have Crohn's disease. They have um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. They have leaky gut. These are all things because... When we're in the stress state and all the adrenaline and cortisone is pumping around our body, we don't digest food because your nervous system thinks there's a wolf about to kill you. So it's constantly trying to get you to move forward and we're not slowing down. So the breath technique slows the body down. It helps it realize, man, right now, everything's okay. Yeah. Five minutes a day, 28 days, game changer. Really, really helpful. You got to be psychic or something because you're you're describing me. You're describing people I know to a T. I'm like, oh, my gosh, they need this. I need this. It's very good. So the, the basics is basically just breathe in to capacity and then breathe in more like another. And then yeah. slowly out five minutes. That's all it takes. Connecting to the breath. And, and, and when, when you do it, you will you will um, you will find that you probably can only do three breaths in a minute. So like even, you know, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm going, hmm. so that last bit, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm having to kind of, it's, it's almost counterintuitive that, you, that there's more there, but there is more there and you can just take that last bit in. But the shift and how that impacts the capillaries inside your lungs is quite extraordinary. Hmm. And we can see the benefits that, that this brings out and, you know, Stanford University conditioned clinical study on this, which is quite astounding because yes. unfortunately we don't get a lot of clinical studies into things that can help us 
recover and heal ourselves from autoimmune disease, anxiety, stress, depression, by using the chemical set that exists inside these bodies, because no pharmaceutical company will profit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they don't want you to heal yourself. <laughs> They'll never make any money. You know, I hear that They'll the pharmaceutical companies are fighting the placebo effect, this ability to just think that you're healing and you are. They say it's like 40 to 50 percent of people are just getting better because they feel like it. Like, oh, I, I can do this. So it's, it's yeah. crazy to think. And I, I appreciate and it, that about uh, uh, your therapist, you know, coming back like, hey, guys, we don't we don't need to take all these drugs to get to a place where we're supposed to be. You said we were born fearless. We got to get back to a place of being fearless, because when you're fearless, you're in the flow state. I like that. 100 percent. And it's it's that intervention. I mean, also cold water. We mentioned that at the start. That's another really fantastic <laughs> it's a tough intervention. One. <laughs> It's a tough yeah, one. I mean, How do you get into this? Uh, I hear everyone talks about it. Everyone loves it. The cold water swimming, cold water baths. Ah, maybe it's time. I should start doing this. You got you to try it, man. I mean, look, the, the, the key thing is you start slowly. You know, it's like anything that you want to do, anything you want to change in your life. Slow and steady wins the race. You know, it's back to how to eat the elephant one bite at a time. So people always want to like dial into cold water. They see people doing cold and they go, oh, I can never do that start off with like 20 seconds at the end of your shower just allow the cold water to come on don't allow the cold water to run on the top of your head because that is pretty horrendous you know that's like <laughs> I, I, you know you remember ice cream headache you know when you're oh <laughs> you're yeah. a kid and you uh. and it's like pfft. so it doesn't need to actually be on the top of your head so you can have the cold water kind of um arrive at the front of your face in the shower and then around the body and then build from 20 seconds. You know, the clinical data, again, is really, really strong on this. And we can see that three to four minutes is the critical point. So the bad news is you've got to move up from 30 seconds. But mm. you will be amazed at the adaptability of the human body, right? It will get used to it. And and if you've got access to, you know, a sea, uh, like if you're if you're in the States and you've, and you've got access to one of the oceans or you've got access to lakes, you know, that that kind of cold water immersion is a lot easier than being in the shower. So I, I live by the sea here in Ireland and I, I swim most days and, and our water is like cold, like it's just varying degrees of cold. It's like super freezing in the winter and then it's just freezing in the summer. Right? There's no, there's no real fluctuation in terms of the temperature. And I'm not I'm not anything superhuman or special. I'm able to just get in because I keep practicing. And most importantly, when you're in the cold water, connect to your breath again because your nervous system will get fired up when it feels cold water it thinks it's going to die and and the logical part of your brain immediately takes over it so you want to pull out but actually staying in when the nervous system is triggered is where the magic is because what we're doing is we're actually dialing up resilience we're showing our nervous system that we can meet the obstacle and we can stay with it and then we push through it when I teach people how to do this in groups and, and I bring them to the sea when it's their first time in and we just have them in so their their shoulders are under the water and they're just kneeling in water, right? So they're not even in a threat in terms it's of their dangerous. own safety. Right. But their nervous system is convinced that they're going to die. So their eyes are darting around. They're going, no, 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 no. I need to get out. I need to get out. I need to get out. And we're like, no, no, no. Okay, breathe. Connect your breath. Breathe. Deep breath in. Breathe out slowly. Deep breath in. Breathe out slowly. And after about two to three minutes, then their nervous system goes from this fight and flight state into this rest and recovery state. And all of a sudden, their eyes stop darting around the place. Their breath slows down and they smile and they go, wow, this is incredible. I'm it's here. So I'm bad. in here. <laughs> yeah, it's not so bad. So it's that idea of, you know, resilience is a muscle that we have to train. We have to work with it. And, you know, even the five minutes of breathing every day, that is a resilience test because it is frustrating to sit when you, with yourself, right? That's not easy. So again, you're taking time to be with yourself, showing up for yourself, connecting to your breath. And this shows your nervous system that I'm not captured by you. I'm the master and I can lead my way out of this. Wow. I'm not stuck in here with you. You're stuck exactly. in here with me. <laughs> yes. Wow. The breath is important. Is there a specific breathing technique or is it the same that the that, uh, Stafford has found? 
for like when you're in the shower or something like that? Is it just a, a normal deep breath or is it the deep breath plus the extra breath that you? Yeah, would I mean, it's it, like it's it can be much simpler from a showering perspective. Just, you know, just connect to, you know, deep mm -hmm. breaths, you know, and, and just try and be with the breath. When we're shallow breathing like the. <laughs> Yeah, because okay. you're freezing, yeah. Because <laughs> you're freezing, right? So if you can imagine, if somebody kind of like burst into your room right there now, you would immediately shallow breathe yeah. and you would put your fists up, up and you'd pull yeah. back, right? Tighten up. Right. So that shallow breathing is tipping your nervous system into the point of, of fight and flight. So you have to kind of fake it until you make it. So you want to fill your nervous system. So by, by not shallow breathing and then finding the capacity to breathe into your belly, and it can be good to practice it before you get in. So, you know, even just sitting on a chair and putting your hands on your belly and getting the point where the inhale through the nose is passing through, you know, your diaphragm and your chest cavity, and you feel like your belly is expanding, you know, you're really breathing deep into, into the body, which is, you know, those people who, who are used to um, practicing meditation and I'm a meditation teacher, this is a critical point in terms of, of that connection from, from Eastern practices. But the great news is that in neuroscience in the last 20 years, we've now been able to identify how this is imperative in terms of shifting our state. You know, everybody's heard Tony Robbins talking about mm -hmm. shift your state. You got to change your state. Listen to the level below what he's talking about. It's always about doing something to reconnect your nervous system and to get yourself back in and the breath it's really simple you don't have to pay tony it. ten thousand dollars right can't beat it it's free Breathe breathing better. is free <laughs> yeah <laughs> excellent i i also wanted to ask you about fasting and i mean you've already given me some tips on meditation and i appreciate those i'm a man of method i love different techniques and i love applying them because they they lead to some some more efficiency uh how do you go about fasting? Fasting has always been an interesting one for me. Yeah. And this, so everything for me always comes back to, you know, what's the neuroscience say mm -hmm. on one hand? And then on the other hand, what are the Eastern practices? And can we correlate these two things together, right? Mm -hmm. So we can see that in, in Eastern practices, fasting has been a huge part of traditions going back thousands of years. So for, for yogis, when you look at, at, at Buddhist traditions, you know, if you look at Christianity, if you look at, you know, um, Jesus in the desert, 40 days, 40 nights, always we're finding this, this theme right now it's, it's Ramadan. So, you know, the Muslim community are, are fasting. So we, we know that the spiritual connection to fasting, we know that the spiritual teachers going back 2000 years to 5,000 years have always been advocating the need for us to fast. And I think, so much of that idea of fasting is also really helpful in terms of us understanding that we can just take a step back from this constant desire to consume and want more. So fasting has, has a spiritual guide part to how it helps us spiritually and mentally and emotionally. But also then, from a neurological standpoint, what we've noticed, and again, some, some really good um, clinical studies on this, um, have, have been looked at into the time periods of fasting. And, and they've identified now, a great study that came out last year has identified now that 16 hours um, uh, in terms of, of fasting and eight hours of eating is the optimal period of time. And that might sound tough, right? But actually really, you know, if you're eating for eight hours, you're, you, you, could, you, could, you could have breakfast at 10 a.m. and finish your last meal at 6 p.m. And, you know, you've probably had lunch in the middle, you're able to eat whatever you want. So what we know is a couple of things that are really interesting. One is that it's really helpful for your microbiome. In terms of um, a lot of the work that I do and a lot of stuff that I talk about on, on my YouTube channel is the vagus nerve and polyvagal theory, which are like critical in terms of key performance metrics for leadership, for professional sports people, all that kind of stuff. And we know that the gut is a key driver for our mental health. So when we fast, what happens? Well, our body is able to move into rest and digest, okay? And what is rest and digest? Well, rest and digest is the other side of fight and flight. Mm -hmm. So our nervous system has three states. It has fight and flight, it has homeostasis, where it's just in balance, 
and it has rest and digest. Most times it's moving between rest and digest and homeostasis if we're healthy, right? But if you've got autoimmune disease, you're in fight and flight probably nearly all the time. Mm -hmm. So by fasting, you optimize the capacity for your digestive system to take a break so that it's not got food pushing through all the time. And this has a really big impact in terms of sleep, because if you can be without food three hours before you go to bed, you will have a much better chance of having a good night's sleep. And the key driver in all mental health studies is sleep. Like number one, if you can get a good night's sleep, you will shift your state big time. Mm. And food is a critical component. The way that we digest food is called peristoiesis, which is like the gut moves in small muscle movements all the way through from the point of you dropping it into your mouth to pooping it out the other end. It's a muscle movement all the way through. Mm. And what you don't want to happen is when you're trying to go to sleep is that this muscle movement is going on throughout your body. You want that to be taking a break. You want your body to be in the best shape and the most relaxed state. So when you sleep, you sleep well. So it's a big contributor for sleep. It's also a phenomenal contributor for weight loss. Unfortunately, most people lean into the weight loss side of it rather than sleep. You got to get um, them somehow. <laughs> but you got to get them somehow, you know, 100%. And, and I use it, to be honest, like one of my main reasons is I use it for rules around food because it's easy for me to eat more than I need to eat. So when I know there's my window and when the window's open, I'll start eating. When it's closed, I stop eating. It means that I keep a steady, healthy body weight. It doesn't fluctuate, but it's really good for your mental health. It improves your gut bacteria. It impacts your microbiome and it multiplies your capacity to recover from autoimmune disease and enhances your nervous system. It is phenomenal in terms of the benefits. But again, it's not easy, right? It's going to be hard at the start. Slow and steady wins the race. You know, get in, try and um, stay with it. Um, it'll it'll hurt for the first couple of weeks and then your body just gets used to it and it's easy. What would you say about long-term fasting? So uh, not just the 16 fast, eight eating hours, but uh, what's your thought on the, like you, you mentioned Jesus and some other uh, spiritual figures who fasted these extended periods of time. What do you think about fasts like that? I think it's really interesting if you want to do it. And I've done, uh, you know, I think... Um, the longest I did a four day water fast. Um, and that was, yeah, that was like super intense. Yeah. The first 24 hours are actually not really that difficult. About 36 hours in, you start to meet yourself in really tough conditions. Um, and, uh, I was, I was actually just recovering from COVID when I oh, decided no. this would be a really good time <laughs> to, uh, to water fast, but I wanted to kind of see if I could if I could really help my immune system um, by by actually stopping having to digest food. I do not recommend this for anybody who's recovering from COVID. Okay, mm. there's, there's no evidence to support this bit of stupidity. Mm. Um, but um, it was it was a really interesting time I had, uh, I think, like day three, your mind is just out of control. Um, all you can think about is food. Um, and then there's a point on day three where literally you feel like a switch flicks and you no longer feel hungry anymore. And you go into day four and actually like, I think it was on day five, I started eating again, but that was more out of, well, I need to kind of socialize with my family again and get back mm. into reality. I didn't feel like I needed to eat anymore. Um, and, and, it, and this goes a, a long way to understand um, a lot of the insights into, you know, like um, the 40 days of fasting in the desert for Jesus. And, you know, we see um, other spiritual leaders um, like Buddha and Krishna. These stories appear all the time. It is really powerful how the body can survive and water keeps it alive. Um, and I found it incredibly cleansing emotionally, spiritually, um, a really nice experience. I wouldn't be like running back into it again. I'll, I'll definitely water fast. Um, and I've, I've done it for the last three years. Um, probably not every 12 months It's probably like 15 months or so, but it's, I think it's, I think it's interesting again, in terms of human performance, I like to do these kind of things. Cause you really, you really get to understand 
there's so much more inside all of us than we give ourselves credit. Yeah, yeah definitely. Got to be able to dig deep. It's another yeah. resilience building. I've done a lot of 100%. fasting. I haven't done so much cold water business. <laughs> I've done some of it, and it's been like, uh, it's been such a shock. It's just, I don't know <laughs> if I could do this. So I, I'll definitely get into the cold water, uh, you know, taking some cold water showers, things like that. Because like you said, it, it does have those scientific results. Like it's been studied and, and, you know, it does help. I love to see how the uh, Eastern practices mix with the spirituality or excuse me, the science that we have today and how they come together. And like, this is why that stuff works. They weren't doing yeah. it for no reason. And I, I absolutely love that. Well, we're going to go ahead and close out here. We've been we've been rocking and rolling for a little bit. Uh, Justin, tell the people watching, listening, where they can find more of you, any projects you're working on, and anything like that. Sure. Um, well, you can find, like, there's a whole bunch of free content on, on these kind of topics. I publish it on YouTube so that people can have access to it who can't um, afford to work with, you know, people like me um, within their companies or corporations or they don't have health care. So there's a lot of free stuff on my YouTube channel. So just go and search up my name, Justin Caffrey, over there. You can reach out to me on my website, justincaffrey.com. Um, and, uh, you know, on Instagram, just underscore Caffrey. But, you know, whatever way you want to reach out. Um, if you if you get on and you try some of the stuff on my YouTube channel, I, I read all of my comments. I mean, we've had, we've had I don't know, a million views on, on, on videos across there. But I, I get back to everybody on a weekly basis. I have a half a day where I respond to stuff. The community that we have on there is, is incredible. And people are just finding this capacity to heal um on their own and, and i want to support that as much as i can i think that's one of the best things that we can do as human beings so um sure reach out to me over there try out some of these practices let me know how you get on and um, and i'd love to hear from people who've heard us today cal excellent i love it i love it so much i love people who give things for free <laughs> to help out because i've noticed that when you give people it's like here here's what i do see if you enjoy it and people you know they they take a morsel and they're like i like this i want the full course like give me give me the whole meal yeah, yeah. so I, I appreciate that and i thank you for that and, and what you do for the community definitely all your research all your studying and the life that you've gone through to get you to this place i appreciate that definitely thanks man i appreciate you saying that thank you and that's going to do it for this episode of the Astro Mind Podcast, guys. Thank you so much for joining me again. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, leave them in the comment section below. All of Justin's links, everything you can find him on are going to be in the description. If you have any questions for him, pop on over to YouTube, contact him there. Use some of those meditations that he's provided. Use what he's talked about in this live stream to heal yourself, to come to a place of homeostasis and flow state. I love you guys, as always. Uh, if you need anything from me, my links are going to be there. If you're trying to pick up the book, The Cure for Enlightenment, it's going to be there. It's free. It's always going to be there. <laughs> so no worries there. Blessings, love and light, namaste, and as always, never stop adventuring. And there is another one in the books. All but abandon our small minds. Scream about nothing but fear. Trying to run up a decline. Maybe one day we'll learn the truth Maybe we're blind by the sign Maybe we're blind by the sign